Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Look, uh, I don't plan to be long, but I plan to take you somewhere deep. Um, for all of you who have been supporting my riding with Rick, uh, more casual laid back conversations, more to come. Uh, but there are those deep discussions that, that necessary information and knowledge that needs to be shared so that we develop an awareness of who we are, where we are, why we are here, and what we can do to change the things that we are no longer satisfied with as individuals and as a collective and race. Uh, today, I'm going to take what I'm going to share with you out of book number 19, Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. And we're going to talk about trauma. And I'm going to visit this uh, throughout the week. Uh, I'm going to visit the book throughout the week. Today, we're going to talk about trauma. I'm going to read from a section on trauma in it. Um, two different pages. Won't take long. And then I'm going to break it down for you and let you go about your business. Um, it says, what I have discovered during the process of my work is that there is a common denominator that cannot be ignored. That common denominator is trauma. The birth of three new branches of science has led to a recent explosion of knowledge about the effects of psychological trauma and how it impacts humans. These new schools of scientific study are neuroscience, the study of how the brain supports mental processes, developmental psychology, the study of the impact of adverse experiences on the development of mind and brain, and interpersonal neurobiology, the study of how our behavior influences the emotions, biology, and mindset of those around us. Then uh, this one thing here. When I am addressing the current condition of the Black collective in America, and I mention intergenerational transmission of trauma as it is associated with the slavery experience, I would generally meet nullifying responses, people looking to nullify what I'm saying through basic understanding, basically individuals who do not understand how trauma impacts the body and mind will have a difficult time comprehending how trauma can be transmitted intergenerationally. The average person tends to see a condition such as post-traumatic stress disorder as a mental condition, and they will omit or overlook the influence of the physiological implications associated with trauma. The truth is that PTSD is first an initiated through a physiological response to traumatic events or an individual event. Uh, additionally, very few people understand the impact of cumulative adversity on a group of people who are consistently exposed to a wide spectrum of potentially traumatic events. Basically, it is extremely difficult to heal the wounds from trauma when a person is consistently experiencing new traumatic events. As technology and understanding of epigenetics increases, we are also learning that there are genetic influences that have a capacity to facilitate the transmission of trauma across generations. At this point, I simply want to identify and introduce some of the common physiological responses to trauma and how they can be transmitted to the progeny of the person who uh, initially experienced the trauma. Because PTSD is such a commonly used term that it is rarely understood, it is totally uh, in its totality, excuse me. I will use it as a primary condition to bear out my position on the intergener intergenerational transmission of trauma. It is important to understand that this is not meant to be a comprehensive exploration of trauma or its general re generational perpetuation. I am simply attempting to create a foundation on which those who seek empirical and pragmatic evidence to support the idea of multi-generational trauma will be able to begin the process of compiling data and analyzing it. The first thing that we must do is develop a clear understanding of the definition of PTSD, which is defined by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5 as displaying a certain, the displaying of certain characteristic symptoms following exposure to one or more traumatic events. Some of the characteristics associated with PTSD include, but are not limited to emotional reactions, including helplessness, fear, and horror, elevated startle response, hypervigilance, problems with concentration, reckless or self-destructive behavior, sleep disturbance, fear of foreshortened future, I'm not going to live long, um, and on and on. Uh, so 
one of the things that I was hearing in the 90s was that it's time for blacks to get over it. It's been at that time 120 some years. It's time to let it go. 130 years, whatever. Time to let it go. And the idea or the notion of multi-generational trauma, the intergenerational transmission of trauma was scoffed at. And so I set out on a journey to look at what was ex uh, extant as far as uh, research data and ways to research and compile upon that data. One of the interesting things that I came upon was studies by Dr. Basil Bambacoke, um and a few others, but there was a few studies done on post uh, Holocaust survivors, talking about the Jewish Holocaust specifically here. And the fact that their grandchildren who weren't even alive or even conceived at the time that the Holocaust took place were literally having dreams about real live situations that they experienced that they hadn't shared. And so we enter the world of epigenetics and you've heard me talk about epigenetics and it's so comprehensive and complex on the front end and the back end. And so I want to be very careful not to go off into that rabbit hole because we could literally talk about epigenetics all day, adverse childhood experiences, uh, its influence on cancer, and so much more. But what I want to focus on is the experience of trauma and how it plays out in behavior that we tend to be scoffed at or we tend to get frustrated with ourselves or we tend to look at one another and the outside world looks at us and no one is talking about where it comes from. Uh, one of the things that we're going to have to do if we're ever going to change uh, our situation is gain an understanding of how we got here. Be willing to acknowledge uh, that something's not right. One of the things that uh, the Jewish uh, Holocaust survivors did is they acknowledged, hey, this isn't normal. What's going on with it? And so they invested in research to understand it. And in that, we understand that there are these epigenetic tags that are created um, when you experience um, trauma. It's a physiological experience as much as it is a psychological and mental and emotional experience. Matter of fact, it's the body that keeps the score. It's the body that uh, literally logs the experience and stores it away. The body remembers just as much as the mind and the body becomes the mind if you're not careful. That's something, you ever see somebody doing something instinctively and you go, why did they do that? That's because the mind is in control and the body is in control. The body is functioning as the primary influencer of what to do instinctively, physiologically, it's acting as the mind itself. And th this happens all the time. When the hair on your uh, the uh, hair on your neck stands up, when you get this gutty feeling in your stomach, all of these are physiological responses to very uncomfortable uh, possibilities. Now, the thing is, when you talk about an epigenetic tag, what you're talking about is literally a marker on the DNA that literally says this happened and it stored information. It stored information. So it's it's almost like a hard drive in every cell, in every gene. It, uh, it's a hard drive that's stored information. And so what happens is when you talk about people being triggered, they're not being triggered in a sense of a memory. They are being triggered in the fact that they're being taken back to the event. So they're literally reliving the event. It's called traumatic memory, implicit memory. And what that means is I'm literally there. And and it, it, and you may not know what your triggers are. You know, and, and, and if you've experienced something traumatic, you've got to understand that nine times out of 10, if you're the descendant of slaves, if you come from generations, even if your family came here right after slavery, so they didn't experience slavery, but they've been here for a hundred years. They've experienced racism. They've experienced bigotry. They've experienced oppression. They've experienced it. Uh, some have done better than others in it, but anybody that says we are on equal footing and that there's no difference is lying to themselves or they're lying to you or both. So what happens is you have this thing called traumatic re-injury or you are literally 
uh, compiling uh, information and data. I mean, excuse me, compiling uh, trauma, traumatic experiences on top of traumatic experiences. We call that complex trauma. Complex trauma is what we experience. We are beyond post-traumatic stress disorder, which is normally from an event. We're talking about complex trauma where we had a generationally experienced trauma, chattel slavery. We were released into a very hostile environment, 12 years of reconstruction, some of the most dangerous times for blacks because we were seen as the enemy. We no longer carried value because we were no longer property and we were considered a threat because we were the skill set and it was dangerous. And so what you have to actually understand in that is it was hostile for us. And so it went up, lynchings went up, burnings went up, beatings went up. Mass incarceration, well, not mass incarceration, but uh, convict leasing, where they literally made it a crime to be unemployed and homeless. Then they jailed us and leased us back out because that's the one way that you could be forced to work without pay is to be convicted of a crime. Uh, Constitution, 13th Amendment. So in all of this, here, here's this, um, here's this conglomerate of experiences that we are going through. So when I started to study epigenetics and what happened with uh, Jewish survivors, I started to realize, number one, the first thing that I saw different from uh, the Jewish collective and the black collective was they never referred to themselves as victims. They always referred to themselves as survivors. They always speak with a certain mindset. The other thing I, I discovered is you can't tell them to forget about it. If you want hell to rain down, tell a Jewish person to forget about the Holocaust, yet we're consistently told, let slavery go, forget about it, it's behind you. In other words, we're literally guilted into believing that talking about slavery is somehow an excuse for what's going on. No, there are no excuses for us not rising and living out, but there are reasons why we're struggling at it. And we have to understand these reasons if we're ever going to truly elevate our level of performance in society, in our families, in our homes, and that all of the things we see that we look at and go, okay, that's counterproductive, that's antisocial, that's antithetical to the whole theme of this empowerment. Why are we doing it? Why are we consistently doing it? It's because it's a part of our traumatic experience. It's because it's literally us reliving trauma that our great, great, great grandparents experienced at the same time uh, our grandparents who received some of that tra trauma passed down genetically experienced their own traumas. And we are now experiencing traumas and many times contributing to the trauma or traumatizing others. One of the ways that we really truly traumatize, and it's very important that you hear me in this if you don't hear me in anything else, is we traumatize our children with the way we talk to them. Lil MF, go sit down, you ain't gonna never be this, blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you something. I created... Uh, the concept of visionetics. It's a part of what I do in my professional environment. And the visionetics is the basic develop, explanation of the development of the self-image. Whatever you're planting as the primary label giver, let me tell you, label givers in the, in the concept of visionetics is those who have the ability to impart upon a child their identity. There's no more powerful of a label giver than a parent most authoritative figure there is, then grandparents and then teachers and other people, clergy. And so you got, when you are speaking into the life or everything you're speaking to your ch child about themselves is speaking into their lives. You're literally turning your words into their future reality because they are going to give gravity to what you're saying. So then what do you do? You've got to actually stop. Let the anger subside. Let the frustration subside. Whatever it is, what do you want to see in them versus what are you seeing? If it's not something you want to see, don't focus on it. Focus on, say, I know you can or you are and speak it into them because you are someone who is either going to solidify their confidence or destroy. It. And once it's destroyed, they will literally break and bend and move the earth to be what you have told them they are. The way that we maintain our sanity is that we behave in a way that is in alignment with our self-image. We cannot believe we are something and then consistently behave in another way. 
it, 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 it is over time going to create a massive psychotic break. We literally align with who we think we are. So when I'm working with people, what I'm doing is I'm helping them reestablish and reconstruct their self-image because most of it has been banged up. And it, it and once it's banged up, it, contis it consistently takes on more damage because it aligns itself in spaces where it can be damaged. And that's some of the things we are looking at. But when we go back and we look at this thing, what we have is this consistent pass down of genetic harm. And it is experienced and then re-experienced. And then we are getting what we would call re-injury. What that means is you take someone who's already been injured and you put them in a situation where they take on an additional injury, completely distinct and separate from the original injury. Now they haven't healed from this, plus they're dealing with this. What are the chances? So what you have to also understand is physiologically, the more injured you are, physiologically, the more strain is put on the body to heal and the more difficult it becomes to heal. Same thing psychologically. The more strain and stress you put upon yourself with consistent uh, negative emotional, psychological, spiritual, and physical encounters, the more difficult it is to recover from that. And ultimately you become submersed in your own injuries and it's hard to come out of it. So, and then you got to also understand psychosomatics. Psychosomatics is the understanding of how the body and the mind are connected. They relate. If you want a healthy mind, you need a healthy body. If you want a healthy body, you need a healthy mind. Not having a healthy mind will automatically start to negatively impact your physical health. Another part of epigenetics. But here's the biggest thing. Epigenetics is greatly influenced. Your, your gene performance is greatly influenced by your environment. What type of environment you in? Shoot. The statistics tell me 85% of us are waking up every day going into a job we hate. Hostile environment, stress levels go up, chronic stress, the release of the, the adrenal gland releasing adrenaline and cortisol, but there's no fight. There's nothing to run from, but you're constantly in that state for hours at a time. It's attacking your body. It's attacking your immune system. It's attacking your heart. It's attacking your kidneys. It's attacking your liver. And you're wondering why you feel this way and you feel that way. You are literally experiencing an epigenetic assault on your physical health based on your mental uh, per 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 perception of what's going on around you. You've got to find a way to get away from it. You've got to find a way to create space. And when you have the situations that we have, where we are in places we don't want to be because we feel we have to be. I don't want to go to this job, but I got to pay my bills. Yeah, you have to pay your bills. You have to eat. You have to feed the kids. You've got to make sure they're safe and in a good environment because how their environment uh, how their environment um, rests is going to be highly infected on uh, how well they perform as students, uh, as they develop into adolescents, as they develop into young adults. It's immensely important that we understand the power of environment. Matter of fact, when it, we're talking about children, when we're talking about epigenetics, there's this uh, branch of study called adver Adverse Childhood Experiences. Uh, I did a workshop on that earlier this year uh, with Harris County Sheriff's Office because they have a reentry program where they're trying to reduce the level of recidivism of offenders. And so what I've done is I've come in to help work with the families, help work with the offenders, also help work with the Sheriff's Department in understanding behaviors. Uh, my goal is, and, it, and it's a bump against the wall, but fortunately I am working with a black major in the department who uh, seems to be on board, has not presented any roadblocks. Uh, so it's one way to reach kids. It's one way to reach parents. It's one way to have some influence on these young males, predominantly who are going away. But we also deal with a rising black female prison population that we also need to be aware of. But let's talk about genetics. Oh, shoot. I got all this stuff. Let's talk about genetics. This is from the workshop that I did uh, with Harris County Sheriff's Office. Um, and I just want to go over some things.
there, uh, your brain is immensely sensitive to epigenetic influences, ep epigenetic changes, epigenetic shifts. And the response, you got to understand that when your brain changes, your brain is literally going to what? Synthesize certain chemicals. Uh, what chemicals are being synthesized? What chemicals are literally being un, uh, what we call uh, downregulated? See, when something is turned on, it's upregulated, and then it can be optimized in the upregulation, or it can be downregulated in the downregulation. It can be turned completely off at the lowest level. And so what you're trying to do is upregulate uh, you know, your immune system, uh, those genes that fight disease, downregulate genes. How do you do that? First of all, you've got to create the right environment. You've got to remove stress from your environment. You also got to create what? Hope. Hope, uh, aspirations, a belief that things are going to get better, looking beyond any momentary or transitory situations that may be tough and seeing that uh, there's a better tomorrow. But for blacks, we have this thing called we have this thing called learned hopelessness, where we have simply watched our uh, and tried and tried and tried. And we've come to a conclusion after so many t amounts of tries that it's impossible. We also have this thing called vicarious learned hopelessness, where we simply look back over time and say, man, our ancestors tried it. Our parents tried it. I'm looking down the street. Tom's tried it. I've looked over here. And through the vicarious experience, we also develop a sense of helplessness. And that is called learned helplessness. It's like sitting up and saying, no matter what I do, it ain't gonna work. Why am I gonna try? So we what? Give up. But in these experiences, we are creating the possibility. So the one thing we can say is we need to fix our situation. But another thing that we need to say is we need to start by building better situations for our children. There are these things called adverse childhood experiences. They are literally experiences, isolated experiences that in compound, uh, when compounded, have negative long-term physical health implications for children as they become adults and live out their lives. So it's not just something that happens to them when they are children. It's something that happens to them um, consistently. Uh, I'm just going to read the top 10 off. Uh, for those who've seen it and heard it before, we need to get familiar with this because we got too many of our children actually operating in a very hostile and toxic environment that is producing all of these experiences. So each one of these is considered in and of itself an ace, an ace. So on an ace score, you take every one of these experiences and you give it one. So you start compiling this and I'm going to tell you why that score is important. So each one I'm going to name to you is one ace. Physical abuse. Verbal ab abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, an alcoholic parent or otherwise addicted parent, an incarcerated family member, the disappearance of a parent through divorce, death or abandonment, a family member diagnosed with a mental illness, a mother who is a victim of domestic violence. Those are the top 10. Now, that family member diagnosed with a mental illness, in our case, may be a family member that's obviously struggling with mental health, but may have not been officially diagnosed, especially males who are going to refuse or resist any type of intervention or treatment or diagnosis. So, again, each one of those represents a point. All you need is four to take yourself into a very scary and dark place. A child with four aces is two and a half times more likely to develop eating disorders, 12 times more likely to attempt suicide, four times more likely to uh, develop ischemic heart disease, the number one killer, uh, four times more likely to develop many forms of cancer. That's right. It is stress and adverse experiences that is the leading cause to disease. The body breaks down under stress. It loses its capacity to fight off. Now, it doesn't mean that your diet doesn't play a role. It doesn't mean that there couldn't be other implications. It doesn't mean that carcinogens can't cause it. What I'm telling you is the body is designed to heal itself, but the more strain and stress that you keep it under, the less 
functional and effective it is as doing, as doing the job it was designed to do. And so we need to understand all these things. First of all, we need to understand how to create spaces for ourselves. We need to understand how to change our environments. We need to understand how to work together. The research that I have done and the research that I am doing gives me hope, but it's also very uh, sobering in the fact that we have so much going on that we don't understand and we don't know. And we are so quickly sold the idea that we are inferior. We're so quickly sold the idea that we're just simply screwed up, messed up, uh, bad behaviors. We, you know, we're naturally or inherently violent and all of this other stuff. We are you know, poverty is our lot in life because, and the truth of the matter is, when you really truly look at who we are and everything that we've been through, the fact that we're still standing speaks to the extraordinary uh, nature of who we are in, 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 uh, in truth and in whole. The thing is, you can take the best of things and you can destroy them. You can take the best of things and you can marginalize its effect. You can take the best of things and you can literally... Um, incapacitate it by misusing it, by mishandling it, by not taking care of it, by not appreciating it. We are struggling in our families because we haven't dealt with a trauma issue. We're struggling in our finances because we haven't dealt with a trauma issue. We're struggling in our relationship and connect in, 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 in comparison and and, and, and whether in connectivity or opposition with other races because we don't know who we are and we are still not having dealt with our trauma. What am I saying? I'm saying that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I'm saying that we need to have programs that support our children. We need to have programs that support marriages. We need to have programs that allow people to confront their trauma without being guilted, to confront their trauma without being made to feel weak, to sit up and deal with the mental and emotional strains without being called crazy. We need to be able to sit up and have resources available for all of these different things. We need to be socializing young black girls and young black boys to be whole. We need to build strong self images so that they are perpetuating habitual behavior in alignment with the self image because then they have high self esteem and they have high, um, uh, high self confidence and they're willing to step out and do the things that are in the realm of phenomenal, the realm of extraordinary, the realm of remarkable and incredible. We are an incredible people, but we have been pushed, pressed, stumped, kicked, cut, shot, hung, and all of the things that come in between with discrimination, microaggressions through the system of racism is one of the most dangerous things because it comes in little pricks, little soft words, little things said, little things you pick up on that isn't overly pronounced how that person, uh, other day I was in the store and I was buying something and there was a, a black cashier, older lady, probably maybe 60. And in front of her was an older white man behind him was an Hispanic woman. And then me, she went all out of her way for him. And oh my God, this, and let me tell you how to do this. Give me your phone and I'm going to set it up for you. I mean, the whole little kit and caboodle. And, you know, so she, she set him up, got him all going and told him everything and saying, when you do this and, and all this, and I'm watching and I'm observing because I've seen this before and I understand where it comes from. So I'm not shooting at her and I wasn't upset or mean with her, but I'm observing and I know where it comes from. So she does all that with him and tells him have an unbelievable day everything except may you know may god come down and cook your breakfast in the morning i mean she went in okay then here comes the expanded lady she says hey how you doing oh that's nice wow i've never seen that before conversation and she asked do you have um a what is you know the little you know thing you put your number in you get you get points do you have rewards do you have a rewards uh account and she said yes so she put it in got to me Hey, how you doing? That'll be blah, 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 blah. And she didn't know she did it. She didn't know she did it where it should have been. Hey, young man. Or hey, brother. 
or hey, it, you know, when I engage, I don't go out being mean to anybody. Anybody that's nice to me, I'm going to be nice to them. I don't need the negative energy. I'm not pushing. But if you come at me sideways, I got something for you. But other than that, I'm 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 I'm, I'm trying to bless people because I want I want to be blessed. But when I see a a brother or a sister, they get love because see I know what they've been through. Even if it's not today, if they have, I know what life is like as a black person. I definitely know what life is like as a black man. So I'm going to show love, but that's not what happened. Hey, look, here you go. It's like in her mind, there's a level of superiority, but it's inferiority. The white man is above me. The Latino woman, lighter than me. The black man, we on the same level, whatever, dude. And it's, so common and the truth of the matter is what we should be learning anyway is that when we see people who may not be where we are we should actually treat them better but this is the society we live in that's literally training us to stump on ourselves and we're literally conditioned and programmed to mishandle one another to perpetuate the cycle because every time somebody mishandles me it's, it's a, a little bit harder, a little bit longer to heal. And we, th so they got us fighting each other. They got us talking down to each other. They have us disrespecting each other. They have us blaming each other. And in all of this, we've lost our own accountability to grow. And it's, it's, it's hurting us. So look, I'm going to keep these things coming. Uh, one thing that I'm going to ask is that you support the work we are doing. Uh, this is book number 19. Uh, I dropped 26, book number 26, earlier this year. I'll be dropping another one before the end of the year and then uh, a couple more at least next year. I'm bringing all of my books back into print. All of them in circulation in certain places. Some of them are not in print, but I'm bringing them all back to print uh, for those who like to actually hold a book like me. But what you need to do, what I need you to do, uh, don't don't scoff on this. Go to the, Go to the description box. Look in the description box. Determine which doc, which way you're going to give, whether it's Cash App, whether it's clicking the link. Uh, but give. We have work to do. We haven't even come close to what we're capable of. But what I can tell you is this idea of Black empowerment that we speak so consistently about is getting further away rather than coming closer. Uh, there are a lot of optics that make us feel like we've made it. But when you look at the numbers, the gap is widening. The level of power is dis, uh, disintegrating. Our families are being dismantled at an unbelievably rapid rate. And it's showing in the performance of our children. It's time for us to take action. On that note, look, I'm out of here. Thank you for letting me take your time. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.